Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here today. So if you can, take a moment. Let's close your eyes. Imagine you're with a person who's your best friend or your closest friend. Maybe you're with them in person. Maybe they're an online friend. Um, whatever your situation, you're typically with them. Uh, just think about this for a moment. Now imagine you told them one of your biggest secrets. Not like, I pick my nose and like the taste of it, but like a really deep secret. Do they seem comfortable knowing this? Do you feel like they're judging you because of it? Are you comfortable having just told them about it? Now imagine instead it's a coworker or perhaps your boss. How do you feel now? What about your barista at a coffee shop? Um, are you still comfortable with all these situations? Do you feel like you could share the secret with these people? All right, open your eyes. Okay, look at your neighbor real quick. Do you think right now if I asked you, you could share that, that secret with them right now? So, hi, my name is Sarah Withy. Like she, uh, Kronda said, I'm a software engineer, I'm a conference speaker, a teacher, and a mentor. Um, and I also like to tinker with hardware and robotics. And if you are wondering, yes, that is shitty robot builder Simone Gertz holding a shitty robot I helped build. <laughs> <laughs> um, typically, I use these as descriptions for myself. But today, I'm going to throw in that I'm also transgender, or trans for short. Uh, most of you know about this, but for the video purposes, I'll explain real quick. Um, basically, a transgender person uh, has a disconnect between their physical body sex and their internal gender that they feel they are. Um, studies have shown that even in between man and woman, there's a whole range of scales in there, and that's not uh, limited to just the two words. And same for bodies. There's not really a either-or system for those two. There's a lot of research out there, and um, especially a lot more than when I was a kid. So I would recommend everybody go out and at least learn a little bit more about it. But anyway, for me, this meant that I was a woman, but I wasn't born in a female body. This is a picture of me when I was young. I obviously don't really look like a little girl. I was still cute though, right? <laughs> um, I was playing pole position at an arcade for a birthday party, which I still think is a really good game. Um, but anyway, the parts of my story you'll hear today um, are not the same issues that every trans person will face, but several of them probably have very similar issues too. So I want to start off talking about being stealth. And trans people refer to being stealth when they blend into their communities or with the people that they know, and um, these people don't know that they're trans. When I first transitioned in 2007, I was involved in the LGBTQ community in Kansas City. I was also very visibly trans, having changed my name, changed my clothes, changed everything about me. It was pretty obvious um, about that. I dropped out of college the first time from depression and gender issues. But in 2001, I went back and went back from, to finish the computer science degree I had started. The first semester of school, I joined three different engineering organizations in the LGBTQ one that was on campus. Um, eventually, I ended up moving up to leadership in the geek ones. They got really involved in competitions and things. And the LGBT one just kind of faded out. And I felt all right because I was happy with myself. I was happy being back in school as a woman this time. Um, just happy being me. So it ended up that I had went stealth. Nobody at school really knew about me or my background. I was just Sarah, the woman, the geek. And I was happy with this. Um, I didn't really need to tell anybody. But over the years, um, as I made more friends and got a lot closer with them, um, and just from conversations with people, I found things were getting difficult. I had to start thinking through if I was telling a story, like, well, back when I was a little boy, I actually had to say, well, back when I was a little kid. Or sometimes I just had to skip stories altogether because there'd be too much background, I have to explain the gender thing, and blah, blah, blah. And so I just... It got more difficult as I started to have to erase parts of my background, my past, um, which got hard as I was making closer friends and things. Um, some of my friends even knew that my parents had disowned me, but to explain that and why they did that, I would have to, again, go into a background story. And it just ended up being easier usually just saying, eh, they don't really like my political beliefs. 
Um, let's see. So the closer to graduation I got, the more geek communities I found myself involved in outside of school as well. But the more I started to end up connecting to LGBTQ people um, on various places. Slack started showing up, Twitter I got more involved in, um, and I started speaking at conferences. And slowly I started to see these separate groups were emerging together. I often felt like um, while I was stealth in the world, everybody saw me the way I wanted them to see me. But I still felt a little bit fake. I felt like I was hiding a little bit too much. I felt like I wasn't truly authentic. That people would find out about me. People would, um, you know, out me somewhere I wasn't expecting to. And I hated this idea. I knew I had to come out before somebody else outed me. And who knows how they would end up doing that. So I had this idea, well, I could do it on Twitter. Hi, my name's Sarah, I'm trans. But this really felt too passe, if you will. Um, just too easy to skip over in that fire hose of nude feeds. Um, people wouldn't see it, things like that. So I decided I should write a blog post instead. Um, I didn't really want to do just a simple, oh, hi, I'm Sarah. Here's everything you need to know about being trans. I really wanted to have a good, empowering story. I really wanted to help people, encourage people and just share a good story maybe they could relate to, even if they weren't trans or LGBTQ. I knew several people had told me in the past that they thought I was brave or courageous for having transitioned um, and just told me I had a really good story. So I thought, well, maybe perhaps I could take this blog post in that direction. I could talk about how when I was little I'd programmed on my Commodore 64 and was fascinated that I could tell this computer how to do things. And I wanted to do that for my whole life, but I couldn't in the middle of that because the depression took over, the gender took over, and my brain just kind of stopped. It didn't want to do anything anymore. But somehow I fought it, I overcame it, became myself, and then became a software developer. And um, got through school, got the degree, and all that stuff. So, all right. So I started thinking on this, like medium.com, that's a pretty good blog post site and would probably get a good amount of attention and people would probably see it. So I decided I would do that. Wrote a post, sent it to a few friends, they offered some suggestions, rewrote it a little bit, gave it to more people, they offered some more suggestions. Um, I ended up doing this seven times, um, seven different revisions. Um, I had a whole bunch of people that had reviewed it and offered really great things, but I found as I kept doing this, I really wasn't changing too much. Like the story just needed to hurry up and get out there. So I made a deadline, Tuesday, September 29th. That's the day this was going to go public. That's the day um, everybody would finally know I'd be out of the closet. Everything would be good. Um, in fact, September 29th was uh, one year on Thursday this week. <laughs> so I also wrote out some tweets that I knew I was going to post the next couple days and had them in text editor. So when I was done, I just hit publish on Medium, copy and paste them. Um, all would be good. Everything would be fine. All right. So that Tuesday came. And I was in the middle of work and time kept going on. And I knew I wanted to do it in the morning or the afternoon so more people would see it. Um, so in the afternoon, about 1 o'clock or so, I went ahead. I hit publish on Medium and it was live. I copied and pasted my tweets from the text editor into Twitter, and just in the few seconds it took me to do that, my heart sank into my stomach. Oh God, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm making a horrible mistake. I shouldn't be out. I'm fine where I was. Oh, jeez. But I had already started. So I finished the tweets and grabbed my phone, and I ran to the restroom at work. Um, I ran into a stall. I was sobbing, and I was shaking, and I was holding my phone, and I didn't know what to do. Um, I opened up the LGBTQ and tech Slack I was a part of, and I went to the mental health channel, and I typed in, somebody please tell me I didn't just ruin my life. Many people reassured me that I hadn't, that this was an important story. It needed to go out there. Um, things would be fine. 
a little hard to believe. Um, I took this selfie to show how <laughs> just distraught I was, and I don't even know why. I actually did it. <laughs> um, a coworker friend of mine, Katie, she tracked me down in this bathroom at work, and after 45 minutes, I was calm enough and not shaking anymore. And so I wiped off my face, and she and I went to a coffee shop real quick. Um, she chatted with me for a while. Um, it calmed me down. But all the while this was happening, I still had my phone, and it was buzzing with notifications. People were liking my tweets. People were re retweeting the story. People were recommending this on Medium. And it was all happening so fast. I remember hoping maybe 50 to 100 people would see it, mostly real life friends, maybe a few occasional Twitter followers. Um, within the first day, over 1,000 people had seen it. Within the first three days, 3,000 people had seen it. And by the end of the week, 6,000 people had seen it. Like, what was this? <laughs> I, I didn't even think this was a real possibility. How could my silly little story have gotten so much attention and so fast? But I was out. For the first time in the eight years since I had transitioned, I was publicly out of the closet, and I knew I couldn't go back in. I had some fears about coming out publicly, like I might lose some of my friends, I might jeopardize my current or future jobs, I might jeopardize all the conference speaking I had started doing. I mean, I knew trans people would come out and everything was fine, but they lived along the coast, and I live in the Midwest. Um, and even out of my friends that I currently had, how many of them you know, that just thought of me as a woman now have this, like, maybe they see me as a fake woman. Maybe they um, just have this altered view of me for some reason. What if all this started an attack of internet trolls and hell froze over and pigs started flying? Uh, you never know with these things. <laughs> it's the internet. But none of this happened. Probably not surprising to any of you. <laughs> As I mentioned, thousands of people had started looking at this post within days. But even as time kept going on, people were still reading this post. Um, it kept getting recommendations for months and months and months, um, as well as likes and retweets on Twitter. And um, I was even getting emails and other messages from places of people that had uh, looked at it. Um, it ended up getting reposted on four other sites. Um, up here I have stats from Medium, and this shows the first eight months of it. Um, they decreased over time, so these are different scales, but I found it interesting that there's hardly any blank spaces in here. This kept getting seen over and over and over for a really long time. And in fact, if I put up the full year, you would still see that. People are still reading it. Um, and this is the most popular thing I've ever done. Even 68,000 impressions have been seen on just that one tweet with that one story from a year ago. And what else happened? I got a message on Twitter. Thank you for writing this. Thank you. Um, you were brave. You were courageous. But they didn't stop. These messages kept coming all day long. All of these were just in the first 24 hours. They called me beautiful. They called the story inspirational. They called it brave and courageous, and so many things, a must read. Uh, people from five followers to thousands and thousands were sending me messages and retweeting this, and it was just so overwhelming. Have you ever struggled getting one compliment? <laughs> Imagine if somebody just came up to you all day long, be like, you're wonderful. <laughs> Talk about imposter syndrome. Um, um, some people came out to me after they had read my story. Um, this is a woman that left a comment on my post. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm a 57-year-old grandmother who, due to the paralyzing fear of my family and society, lived a lie, got married in high school, and did not begin living a life as my true self as a lesbian until I was in my 30s. You're such an amazing woman and have such courage, compassion, and drive. Many will be inspired by your struggle and success in being you. 
um, some even anonymously had come and told me about some of their depression struggles or other struggles they had had, um, those hurdles that they had had to overcome to be successful themselves. This person even went out of their way to anonymously send me a message on their website, um, used a fake email and address and everything, and works at a really, really, really major company. And they wrote me and they said, thank you. Hi, I'm a 22-year-old, 22-year-old stealth female to male, and I wanted to thank you for being, or thank you for both of your Medium articles. I love both, and <laughs> I both love and hate being stealth. It was great to feel normal at first, but seven years later, I feel too normal? Weird. I don't know if I'll ever come out the second time. Too scared, I guess. But it really is nice to hear that maybe I could if I wanted to. Thank you for your courage. Us young ones really draw inspiration from role models like you. I tweeted the next day. I had this weird dream where I opened my soul to the whole internet yesterday and Twitter responded wonderfully. That would be silly, right? And notice I posted this at seven in the morning, like I had literally just woken up and I had this overwhelming feeling. People were doing the exact opposite reaction of what I expected. Um, no pigs were flying, no hell freezing over. I was getting 100% positive feedback on this. Nothing horrible was happening. Current friends were telling me they had read it, it was great. Um, I ended up making more friends through the process. Other conference speakers were telling me they had seen this and they were inspired by it, um, including some pretty big names like Anil Dash. Um, <laughs> nothing like getting this heartwarming story of uh, this really famous guy and it's like, oh, I loved your story. I'm gonna tweet it tomorrow so it gets more attention than it would now. One year later, I still hear about stories like this. Um, this is from this week. I think I took this uh, snapshot at the airport. Um, and I talked about the one-year anniversary was just the spike at the bottom. But it's still getting read almost every day. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still surprised by it. And even as I was making this presentation, I'm still like overwhelmed with the feelings of all these people. Um, and how did I ever come to influence so many people? Um, but the more they did it, the more I felt the weight coming off of my shoulders that all these scary feelings were turning out all right. They were turning out amazing. So why did I just tell you this really long story about this little blog post? It's because I've spent the past year reflecting on vulnerability. How many of you think of vulnerability as a bad thing? Kind of, not a lot of hands. Um, I think often when we think about vulnerability, it's usually not good things. We think about like a person in a dark alley and what bad things might happen to them. Or basically any horror film ever where somebody's going in the woods and you know something's gonna happen to them. Um, what if I told you I thought vulnerability was a good thing? What if I thought it was the basis of great friendships? Um, all of these are people I've met online at my last vacation I took. Um, are you best friends with somebody because the weather's nice or you like their pet or um, they read the same book you did last? Um, probably not. You're likely best friends with somebody because you bonded over something vulnerable. You had some deep shared experience or it's just you ended up sharing something important with them. Brene Brown studies human connections, and she set out to study several of them and ended up spending so many years on her research. And she gave a TEDx talk about it called The Power of Vulnerability. And she said, I know vulnerability is kind of the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness, but it appears it's also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging, of love. I love this quote. She's right though, think about it. Do you fear the unknown more than the known? Are, and are you really creative if you know exactly what's going to happen when you try something? Everybody's favorite painter, Bob Ross, um, really likes to encourage creativity. He likes to say things like, there's no mistakes, there's just happy accidents. Um, and you might laugh at this like, oh, that's Bob Ross for you. But think about it. 
Have you ever really listened to him when you watched one of his videos? He always talks about trying something new, even when you don't know the result. But even if you mess up, it's still great. Um, all of his episodes of The Joy of Painting are being put on YouTube, and you've probably seen at least one before. I would recommend going to see one again and just listen to what he says. He never corrects the user or tells them the right way to do things. It's always just uh, put a tree there. That's the right place for it. Um, it's always correct however you end up doing it. Vulnerability is what makes humanity real. When was the last time you saw someone who had like the perfect hair and the perfect smile and you just didn't like them because you're not perfect? Well, what if they came up and told you about all the bad things that are happening in their life, all the things that are going wrong, um, how they don't see themselves as perfect? Wouldn't you change your opinion of them? Um, I won't ask for any of your hands, but how many of you get road rage? Uh, uh, good. Put, your, put your hands down. Um, when you're driving along and a car cuts you off or, um, you know, whatever, uh, it's an inconvenience. It annoys us. Uh, you probably get angry. You may swear. Whatever. Um, but what if you thought about the person behind the wheel? What if they weren't trying to be a jerk? What if they were, they had a kid in the hospital and they really wanted to rush to go see them? What if any sort of event wasn't causing them to just be mean, but just they had a thing going on. All of a sudden, they're more human, right? You might not be as angry about that car that cut you off because there's a real person behind that wheel, a person with problems. I think vulnerability can also make teams more productive. This looks like your team, right? <laughs> Google did a study trying to find what the most productive team would be and what it would look like. Um, the Wall Street Journal has an article on it, but long story short, after years of research, they found out it wasn't traits like age groups or genders or experience levels. The most empathetic teams were the most connected, and because of that, they were the most productive. Think about it. If you're scared to ask your coworkers questions, it affects your productivity, doesn't it? Um, if you're scared to tell them you're stuck on something, it affects your productivity. And if you're afraid of what they think, then you'll be more self-conscious about your own work. But that also affects your whole team, too. More relaxed teams are more comfortable with each other, and they won't judge each other as easily or worry that they're being judged. Everyone benefits from this. Um, don't get me wrong. Being vulnerable is scary. Anytime a friend rejects us for something we've said or done, or anytime somebody laughs at an idea of ours, Anytime we try something new and it fails, all of these are legitimately scary things. But without these, we don't grow as people. Um, we don't become stronger. We don't become smarter. We just kind of stay stuck where we are. Um, so what happens when I started embracing vulnerability? I connected with more people. There's like networking events where you briefly meet somebody, and this is not a bad thing. Like I love meeting all of you. I'd be happy to do it. But after I published that post, I connected with people. Um, we had something we had already bonded about. Um, I was telling somebody, like when I filed bankruptcy in 2009, and they were saying they were already thinking about it, and they, I got to answer questions for them about whether they should do it or not. We connected over that deep issue. Um, I also discovered I'm really thankful when friends share stuff with me. Um, it means they trust me. It also means I find them more real. Their imperfections help me accept my imperfections better. And I always really make sure to tell them thank you. Because when they share their imperfections with you, it's like a gift. They trust you as a friend. But in return, you can be that friend that they can share with. You can offer that friendship as a gift to them. I also found when I embraced vulnerability, I started to try out new things. I started scary things. Um, so as a trans person, I've always been really self-conscious about my voice and how it sounds. So I realized earlier this year that I sing in the car all the time, and I actually like it. So I tried something. This is a screenshot from a video I sent a friend of mine where I sung a song, and I'd never done this before. And I asked this friend, how much do I suck? Unanimously, 
the several people I sent it to said, I didn't suck. I was actually good. I was on key. Um, clearly, this was a thought that hadn't even crossed my mind. And when Kansas City started the Heartlands Trains course this year, I joined. Um, and I sung at Pride. This was Pride this year in Kansas City in front of people. <laughs> and then I decided to try out for the Kansas City Women's Chorus two weeks ago. And I didn't make it. This is my rejection email. I was disappointed. I felt like a failure. But the director wants to coach me. Um, she, wants, she sees my potential. So we're scheduling a time to start working together. I believe embracing vulnerability helps our teams too. As I mentioned before, not having the fear of how we look to our teammates is amazing. I started a new job over two months ago. Um, this is a picture of my team uh, taken earlier during the week at a team building activity. But I started this job knowing I would have a huge learning curve. Um, it's for a medical science research institute that studies cures for diseases and cancer. I know nothing about any of this. Um, and the software is so big, and it's so weirdly complicated from all the scientists' requirements. Um, but for as often as I feel I'm not working fast enough or doing good enough, my team has been encouraging me. They tell me they think I'm doing great for where I am, that they're impressed how fast I've learned two new frameworks in a week, um, how the developers went to my talks at the last conference we all went to, um, and they liked my talks. These have been helping me feel less fearful there. Compare this to my last job where I worked where I had multiple managers that didn't communicate with me. I had a constant fear I was doing things wrong. Um, and I got too nervous to ask questions. One of the most highly respected senior developers there actually laughed in my face when I was stuck and I had to ask a question. Imagine what we could achieve if our teams were more connected and we helped each other out instead of feeling vulnerable. Vulnerability is scary. Secrets are scary. I should know. I've just admitted to a group of at least 200 people that I'm trans. I posted a picture of me crying in a bathroom after publishing the scariest blog post I've ever done. And this talk has made me super nervous as I wrote it because I knew it was going to be recorded and put on the internet where nothing leaves the internet. Um, and it's a good chance that most of my team is going to end up seeing this talk because they've heard little tidbits of why I was leaving for Portland this week. Um, there's many times I've thought about emailing Ash and saying, I changed my mind, I don't want to do this. Uh, can we do like a few years from now? Um, but I didn't. Because vulnerability enhances our lives and it helps us grow as people. I know I'm a better and stronger person after giving this talk right now. And I hope you can see how this can work for you too. So close your eyes one more time for me. Think about that best friend again. Do you feel that connection with them? Is it based on liking the same kind of pets? Or is it based on something deeper? Would you be able to tell them another secret about you? What about your coworker or your boss? What about your neighbor sitting next to you right now? It may still be scary, but how would these relationships be better if they had a more authentic you? Okay, would your workplace improve with the more open team? All right, open your eyes. I challenge you to think on this. Maybe the end result isn't as scary. Maybe things would be fine. And maybe there's more positive power from your secrets than you thought possible. So my name's Sarah Withy. I'm at Geeky Girl Sarah on Twitter. And I'd love to hear your stories about how this has affected you or how you've embraced vulnerability. So please email me or tweet me or just come find me around here. Thank you very much.